Hello. Did you guys have a good lunch? That was all right. Um, just a couple kind of like housekeeping stuff. If you have questions so that they're on the video properly and on the live stream, you can either use that mic in the center, you can raise your hand and I'll throw this at you. Uh, either way, we just wanna make sure that questions are recorded as part of the stream the same way that the rest of the talk is. Um, was, was that correct? Okay. <laughs> uh, outside of that, I am, uh, you know, I'm happy all of you are here. Kelsey's really happy all of you are here. Kelsey's gonna talk about externalizing data it's going to be awesome. Uh, Kelsey came to us uh, via a very odd background, I guess. Uh, weren't you like escorting comedians around for a while? Yeah, I was escorting and comedians <laughs> were involved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Like, that's my intro is how you bring me up? <laughs> you totally copped out. You're supposed to do all the research. I, I rap this stuff, man. Gotcha. Uh, so anyway, Kelsey is, out, is a remote employee for us, but he just recently got a promotion onto uh, our operations team, and he's leading that team now. So uh, this guy knows Puppet. He's going to talk a lot about this stuff. And welcome, Kelsey Hightower. Wow. I actually counted on, like, this many people at this talk. Um, so I'm going to give you guys a, a warning now. Um, this talk is really for new users, so I'm not going to try to impress you and wow you with higher skills. So I know people are probably checking for ninja skills around data separation, um, but you will see some new stuff that's in uh, Puppet 3.0, how we've integrated uh, some of the data story and a progression to that. So if you're a higher master and you feel like you, I will waste your time, I, don't, I won't be mad if you left now. Because um, you know, you, you come to a talk expecting more, so I'm trying to give you a heads up now. Um, so this talk, I normally have a lot of comedy in my talks, but this talk will be serious business. Right? It's going to be about data, and we're going to really focus on that. Um, and this is going to be my first like, live talk. I don't know why I decided to do that now, but I'm going to do a little bit of live code to show people kind of how it really works. I think that will help some of the new users out. Um, but first, let's get started with what, what is Puppet Data? Right, so there's a lot more things to the data story than this, but the biggest parts are like class parameters, variables. Um, I also consider classification part of the Puppet data model. Uh, reports, so things that happen after the run. We get a bunch of data, we get metrics, how long, the, uh, how long it took, uh, what resources pass, what resources fail. You can do a lot with that data. And then store configs, right? You'll hear more about store configs in Puppet DB after my talk with uh, Deepak. But in this talk, we're going to mainly focus on class parameters and variables, meaning we, this is what, I think these are the first steps you need to do to get to a point where you can actually use some of the other features like an ENC, think about things like Hira, and sharing your modules on the forge. So I'm going to actually have an open SSH module that actually works. Hopefully it doesn't fail me uh, during this uh, live demo. And we're just going to look at some real puppet code that's typical for a service that uh, hopefully we all know, which is open SSH. So we're going to jump over and it's going to take a quick look at um, what the code looks like. So this is your typical module. Um, a lot of new users, they don't use parameterized classes, right? A lot of times if you're st getting started with that documentation, and this is a PCI module. So what I usually, at my old company, we had a lot of PCI audits, and I usually put a lot of comments in my code explaining why I made certain design choices. But normally what I see new users do, and it's not necessarily wrong, is that they're just getting started. So we're going to walk through this, and then we're going to look at how we would refactor some code like this to actually make use of things like hiring and C. As you see down here, this is all the part that I call data. Um, so this is SSH has a config option called allow users, and all the users that you have in there are only the users that can log in. There's some other things that are kind of specific to PCI recommendations, and we just have our data right here hard-coded into our module. This is very typical. Um, we have a package resource. Just make sure the SSH package is installed. Um, we have a config file with the template that makes use of some of this data up here. So it's your typical module. And if we were to run this, wow, it gets really silent when you're like coding live. <laughs> oh, that's weird. And then you can't type anymore. Um, yeah, that server. What was that? Yes. I'm going to probably get one of those. All right, so what we're going to do, 
and we're gonna do dash T for testing so we can see all the pretty output and it doesn't fork itself into the background. And yes, I'm using auto signing, so you won't see me sign a cert. And if you dare do that, that will be bad. Oh, so we fail. But I know why. So we run the module, we get our cert, and our SSH module applies cleanly. So for most of you, what we normally do when we apply a module, we simply just classify our node using nodes.pp or site.pp which is the most common usage. So if you look inside that PP, we have our node name. And in this case, I'm including a bunch of users that I, I plan on adding to different nodes. And I just include the module that I want. So this is the typical use case that we see uh, when we're working with Puppet. Um, if I attempt to log onto this box, I'll attempt to log in, I'm gonna get denied. So I get this nice message of the day with all this scary stuff that if you hack my box, I will sue you. That's if I can probably find you, which I won't. Um, I don't know why people even have those. Like, oh wow, message of the day, I'll leave your box now. <laughs> That's like fail. So if you think your message of the day is working, it's probably not gonna hack you anyway. Um, so the bad thing about that, I couldn't log in. So if I wanted to add more users to this module, this is what you typically have, have to do. You probably have to go and edit this uh, manually, which most people think is cool, but it really isn't. So you can come down here, you check out your module if you're using version control would be a good thing, but now I wanna make sure that Kelsey can actually log into this box. So I'll grant Kelsey access, right? And I'll save my module, I'll run Puppet again, Look at that, fail again. There we go. So we run it again, and we see our changes, and we now allow Kelsey to log into the box. Hopefully you get success this time. Wow, we're in the box. All right, so now, that's really cool, but imagine someone is also modifying the structure of the module at the exact same time that you're making that data change. Then you get all kind of merge conflicts. At that point, you're failing, right? That makes people, that turns people off instantly. And this is one thing we wanna do in this talk is explain what can we do to provide a better workflow. So if we were to analyze that workflow, you CD into your modules directory, you VI your module directly, you make your changes, then you commit your code. Hopefully you don't get any merge conflicts at the same time. If you do, you have to sort that out. That makes releasing pretty, pretty hard. Um, and then you have a good commit message. I did all that just to give Kelsey access. That's a lot of work just to manage one particular data element. And then you push up your changes and you deploy it out to your master server. So that's okay if you're just adding users to one array, but imagine when you wanna do something different depending on what host checks in. You end up having to do something like this. We have a selector here where we're saying if we get the Debian host, allow Kelsey to get on that box. If it's a BSD machine, we're gonna allow Zach and Cody to jump on the box. Um, and by default, we won't allow anyone on our servers. The sad thing about that, that makes your data cry, right? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want that. That's, that, that's pretty bad, so I think we can do better. But the first step of doing better, in my opinion, is moving to parameterized classes. So I see a lot of people try to go wholesale and cut over from what they have and move straight to using Hira and embedding Hira functions throughout their manifest and ask people to use grep to figure out what data values they need to, uh, to support. So we're gonna start by just looking at parameterized classes. Yes, my demo warnings. So that means I need to give you guys another demo. So what we'll do is look at a parameterized class. Now I won't type all this out. I will just actually show you guys what we need to do to get there. So the first thing we wanna do is we're gonna take our data from the bottom of the module and move it up here in between uh, the parentheses. And this is basically the same thing, except for we moved it up here, and now that we're using parameterized classes, all our hard-coded values become just default values. So at this point, that becomes like what I consider our public API. So if you download a module from the forge, you're looking at someone else's code, and if, and if you're exposing things here, this is all I expect that I have to change or what's configurable. Any other variable assignments lower down, those are private to the module and you don't expect anyone else to change it. So if you go here, that sets us up nicely to start using Hire or EMC. 
and we can apply this. So now when we're using a parameterized class, we have to do something slightly different in our site.pp to make use of it. So we're not going to modify allow users here. If you notice that the company name has no default value, that means whoever consumes this module has to supply that value or we're going to get an error in Puppet. So let's go ahead and update our site.pp now to use that. Yes, you guys probably know some awesome Vim tricks, like you can just highlight it all and comment it out. I don't know that trick, so bear with me. So now we have our node declaration. We're including our users class, and here we're using a class resource, and we're basically going to specify the parameters that we want to add. Right? So this is a way of, this is like one step of externalizing the data. We took it out of the module, and we moved it to site.pp. So from there, we can start manipulating some of the data values that are exposed and what I was saying is there a public interface. We'll save that, and we'll rerun our agent. And you guys laugh at my pain, that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> terrible. So we got a few changes here, nothing really specific. Um, I'm not allowing password authentication, um, and that's the only thing we change in our thing. So if we want to add more data, instead of jumping into the module, we can just edit this again. I'm going to remove access for Kelsey. And this becomes our new workflow. So users can do all their work inside that PP instead of messing with the module. The good thing about that, so we see that in our diff output, that Kelsey no longer has access to the server. So the good thing I like about that is people can free to refactor the SSH module all they want. If they leave the public interface the same, our site.pp will still work, right? And we can have people working in parallel. We don't have to worry about as many merge conflicts as we can, but that's only one step further, and we'll look at how to do something better than that. So our new workflow is we go into Etsy Puppet where our configuration lives. We're staying out of the module path. This is important. Um, now we just edit our site.pp. Site.pp. Uh, as we'll see, is one of the built-in node terminus. It's like where you can classify things. We make our changes, we add it, we commit it, um, and we avoid all the merge conflicts with the module. Especially if you're using modules from the forge, you don't want to go in there and start manipulating with it because then it's going to be hard to upgrade in the future. So if you keep them separate, even in separate repositories, try not to just commit all your code and your data in the same repository because it defeats the purpose. You really want to work on those two things in parallel. You may even have different versions and release dates for your data and your module code. And then it becomes really trivial to add another node, right? So we remove the selectors, we move the if statements from our code, and we can just add another node without touching the module again. So now we're in parameterized class, we can start thinking of taking a look at Hira. So Hira's uh, been around for a little over a year now. Um, it was transferred from Ari, the guy that wrote M Collective. So now Puppet Labs manages it. And we went through and we fixed a lot of bugs. We cleaned up a lot of code. And we, we prepped it for full integration into Puppet 3.0. So starting in Puppet 3.0, Hira will be a first class citizen. It will always be there. You don't have to install it third party. You don't have to go and get a gem and make sure it's there and find the Puppet functions. All that stuff will be integrated or be a hard dependency. So if you're using a module from the forge that has Hira built in, it will work. It will just work in Puppet 3.0. Uh, we it's backwards compatible, so we'll still work with Puppet 2.7. Um, so it was mainly a refactor to clean up some of the duplicate code um, and a couple of bug fixes and some a few features people asked for. And it set the stage for transparent class parameter lookups, and we'll see that in just a moment. So Hira, Hira is about dynamic data. Um, if you guys haven't used Hira before, Hira takes factor. And it takes some of those dynamic values. So each of your hosts will have different facts. We're going to see how those facts play into our hierarchy. Um, and you can also use facts inside of some of your data when you're doing a lookup. But we won't talk about that. We'll just talk about how you can just structure your hierarchy that makes use of your facts to get dynamic data. Um, Hira supports pluggable backends. So Hira is a read-only tool. right? It doesn't write or save data. Hira assumes that you're going to use maybe one of its default backends, like JSON or YAML, plug your data in there, how we'll read it at runtime and make use of it in your manifest. Um, and then some people already have data in, let's say, Redis or MySQL database. You can write your own Hira backend and Hira will read data from there. The only thing you're responsible for is answering a question. It's going to give you a lookup, 
and you provide the answer, however you provide the answer. Um, hire is not concerned, so you can do all the magic you want to. Um, and that's just so we can have a generic enough tool because we can't support all workflows with just the YAML backend. Um, and hire comes with a set of lookup functions, right? So you can embed them in different places in your manifest to look up values, and we'll see what that looks like. So by default, hire ships with the YAML backend. Uh, it's easy to get started with, but you do have to learn YAML. I heard from some new users that learning YAML is not the easiest thing in the world. So a lot of people that have more experience be like, oh, it's just YAML, just write YAML and you'll be fine. Actually, there is some syntax challenges for it. A lot of people are just not used to it. Um, surprisingly, people are more used to XML than writing YAML, right? Um, so when you're trying to help somebody out get started with it, it does take time for people to grasp the concepts of how things need to be formatted. But this is the same data that we were specifying in site.pp. When we were classifying our node, we just moved it from site.pp into this YAML file. And we'll look at the different hierarchies in a minute. And hierarchy comes with lookup functions. So inside of our code, we can do things like, hey, I want to look up allow users. And we want to assign the result to this variable. Here's the parser function that you actually use inside your code. Here's the lookup key that I want to look up. So I'm assuming that that key is in one of my data backends, and that's my default value. So if I can't find the key, use that as a default. So I can use this to add more users to particular servers. And right now, this is just a generic, it's coming in a generic source. So we haven't attached this anywhere in our hierarchy, but we'll see what that looks like. Once hire runs, if this was the data in our particular data source, we apply the hire function, we just assign what we find in our YAML backend. This could be more complicated if you're using like a SQL backend, right? You can run some select query, it returns an array, and we can assign it to this, it'll actually do the exact same thing. Hire works the same way, it's agnostic to how the backend works. It just it asks a question, the backend returns an answer. Installing hire, we have OS packages now for hire. Before the model was you use gems and you move the parser functions in the right place. Um, that wasn't really great for usability, so we moved to some OS packages for all the OSs we support on the open source side. You'll see them in our repo, so if you're not accustomed to our repos, there's yum.puppetlabs.com and there's app.puppetlabs.com, and you can get the Hira um, packages there, which we support versions 1.0 there and available. And the same thing, we still support Ruby Gems because a lot of people still use that as their primary deployment tool for Hira. All right, so one of the biggest confusing things new users have with Hira, our doc documentation is almost non-existent except for the home page at GitHub. And the biggest thing they have trouble with is how do you configure Hira? Hira's configuration is just a basic YAML file. And you're responsible for saying what backends you want to use. You can have multiple backends. By default, it ships with the YAML backend, but you can use like a YAML backend, and the way Hira works is it will progress through your backends looking for an answer. The first backend to provide an answer, it just stops. So most people may say, hey, the ops team controls the YAML backend. We, we put in mainly the default data. If we, if we set a value, that's it. If we don't set a value, and another team is managing, let's say, the MySQL backend, it will fall through and look for that value there. Each of the backends usually have some backend specific configuration data. So for the YAML backend, its configuration data, or its configuration data is specified by the same name as the backend. And in our case, we only need to specify where the data directory is. And inside of our data directory, it's just a bunch of YAML files that we'll use in our hierarchy. And the last part of the configuration is your actual hierarchy. So what Hira does is, in most systems, you, you think of a hierarchy as you do overrides as you go down the hierarchy. So you think you set a value here, and if it's set at the next layer, you override it. But Hira does that a little different. It works the opposite way. The first level in the hierarchy that provides an answer, it just stops. So if you have default values, you want to move them higher up in the hierarchy. So in our hierarchy, we're basically saying anything that's specified to the fully qualified domain name, our host name, if it's a value there, that's the most specific for the node. The next thing we do is say the environment, right? So if a node happens to be in a specific environment, any answer that comes from there that wasn't specified in the higher hierarchy, we'll use that value. If nothing's there and no answers are found, we use what we find in global. So where are these, so these get substituted. So you see the per percentage curly braces. Those mean that those will be substituted by factor at runtime. 
the ones that are not in curly braces, those are just hard-coded values and they will always be part of the search result when you do lookups. If you run factor and we wanna look at the fully qualified domain name for our host, if we run factor and I'm asking them for YAML output, you see that my FGN equals um, debian.puppetconf.lab. So this is our hierarchy. At runtime, when we get all our facts, by default, every node's in production, that's what our hierarchy ends up looking like. So once hire takes care of that, it can proceed going through the back end saying, hey, do you have a key for this particular source in your back end? And then you're responsible if you have a custom back end for answering the question. All right, so now we've got to the configuration, right? It's the boring part. Now it's about to get real. Like a long journey and then you see this guy. So we're gonna show a little bit about Hira. And we've already moved to parameterized classes, right? So we'll look at that code and see what we can do with Hira now that we know what values we're responsible for. And here I cheat again. Pre-done. So what a lot of people do is, instead of having people use nose.pp, because nose.pp is pretty static, right? Whatever you set there, or incite that PP, that's it, you're done. You can't take advantage of things like, if it's in this environment, you get this value. If it has this host name, you get this value. So instead of doing that, a lot of people like to resort to Hira. So what we've done is we've taken out all of our default values, and we put the parser functions in its place. So what happens is at runtime, Puppet will actually run all of our parser functions first, see what value they return, and stick them in there and then continue compiling your catalog. So it's like a two-step process. It kind of works the same as parameterized classes. For things that you want the user to supply a value for, when you call the hire function, don't specify a default value, and then it will blow up if hire doesn't have an answer. Things where you do want a default value, you put a comma and you put the default value. So if you look at this, this looks just like our parameterized class, except for we're using hire to look up the data. So now we wanna have our node take advantage of Hira. So we'll look at our data really quick. And I have all of my data under Hira. So this is the actual data for the specific node. So if this node checks in, which is at the top of the hierarchy, it has all of these values, all right? And then any node that happens to be in production, well, we don't have any values there. And then we'll look at defaults. Actually, we'll use the word global in our hierarchy. And this is just global values. So if there's no node specific data, if there's nothing specific for the environment, this is our fall through. Now to make use of that, we go back to site.pp. And we're just going to to use this specific to get higher in the loop. Now before you actually run, you can actually test this on the command line. Um, Hyrule was built in a way where it was supposed to be agnostic, so it wasn't like a Puppet only tool. I haven't seen it used in other cases outside of Puppet, but one of its design goals was that it could be. So on the command line, if you run Hyra, and you say I wanna look up the port, we'll put in debug mode so we can see what we get out of it, you see what it's doing, it's starting our back end, it's saying, hey, I'm starting the YAML back end, and I'm looking up this key called port, and right now it's only looking at our global, in our global uh, data source. Why is that? So when we take a look at our actual higher config, we get nothing for environment and fully qualified domain name, because we haven't passed it any scope, we haven't given it any facts. So in order to do that, if you run the factor command, you can actually dump your facts to YAML, so in this case, we'll say our fully qualified domain name is uh, the name of our node, and then we'll use production as our environment. So we can rerun factor, or we can rerun Hira, and we'll say that we have a YAML scope that we would like to use. And then when we rerun it, we actually get something different this time. Now we're getting port is equal to 222. Where did that come from? It actually came from the no specific part of our hierarchy. So we gave it a fax, it basically substituted that in, and it found it in that data source first. In our case, our data source is really simple, right? It's just a YAML file on disk. And the good thing about it being a YAML file on disk, people can make changes here, 
commit it and see what's changed over time by just using something like Git. So it's pretty straightforward. So now that we got hire enabled, we should be able to run our agent again. Ah, can't define resources twice, which is also a node is considered a resource. And we won't be using this again. So we run that again. And now we're getting our values from Hira. So now the workflow becomes, you just edit your backend data files. I'm going to remove a few users. And we look at our agent output. Everybody on our operations team at Puppet Labs has access to this box. So now instead of managing data in site.pp, we move it all to Hira. And in this case, we'll rerun Hira again. I made my changes here. You would normally save that and commit it. And now when we run Puppet, those changes get picked up automatically. So we see that we've removed a couple of users off the system. So that's basically how Hira works, right? But the problem is those lookup functions aren't cool. Those are, they look like you're littering your puppet code. A lot of people don't li look like the way it looks visually. It drives our UX people insane to see this extra function lookup call everywhere that, where there's data. And our project manager just gets sad <laughs> when you use higher functions in Forge modules. If you're using Puppet 2.7 and you download a module and you don't have higher installed and you go to run it and you're just like, wow, this is fail. So if you want to be a good citizen on the Forge, try not to use the higher functions. It will be there in Puppet 3.0, but as we'll see, there's probably a better way. Um, so we talked about the YAML backends. There are other backends, right? We're not going to show them all here, but Hire GPG is an awesome backend if you want to encrypt some data. Hire can decrypt that data at lookup time. It works just like the YAML backend, but it relies on GPG. Um, there's Hire Redis. I think everyone in here has probably written a Hire Redis backend. There's a couple of them on GitHub. Um, there's Hire JSON, so if, if YAML is not your thing, you can use JSON. And there's a Hire MySQL module for backend for Hire. And you can find these on GitHub. You drop them in place. Some of them have good documentation on what parameters you need to configure. Like for instance, for the MySQL one, you need like his username and password and what database to connect to. And it'll use that to get all its queries. And it usually tells you how you need to store your data in that particular backend for it all work. So, but there's a lot more you can do to data. Hire is probably just the beginning. It's the easiest thing people can do to start externalizing their data. It's funny, like, I thought this was data, and then someone corrected me, like, that's not data, that's like his clone, and he's impersonating them. Some of these people take this way, way too serious. <laughs> <laughs> it was a cool picture for the slide, right? So I had to defend myself, um, and that's one of the reasons why I don't go to Dragon Con. It's like, if you're not on your sci-fi, they don't let you in. So the next step um, is the ENC. I prefer the ENC over any of the data solutions we looked at so far. Um, the reason why I like the ENC is they don't really make, they don't make you change your code to use them, right? The ENCs are responsible for classification as well. So what we saw in site.pp, where we're actually giving nodes classes, the ENC, that's its job. It's external node configuration. It can also handle class parameters, and a thing we don't like to speak about anymore are global variables. This is what people have been using forever in Puppet. Just global variables, they stick them anywhere and hope for the best. Stop it. <laughs> That's the only recommendation I can give you, stop it. And we haven't made it easy for you to stop it in the past. Uh, we're gonna force you to stop it in Puppet 3.0 so stuff will just break and we'll laugh at you. <laughs> um, but parameterized classes are the thing that gets you there faster. Um, and then we're going to talk about we can control the environment with the ENC. So instead of updating your puppet.conf on all your agents, you can actually do that in your ENC. We're not going to look at any GUI-based ENCs because I want you guys to understand what an ENC is. A lot of people think the ENC is the puppet dashboard or they think it's a script that you saw in the Pro Puppet book. Um, that's not all there is to an ENC. There's a couple built-in ENCs that pretty much no one uses. Most people use a, the 
the exec ANC, which the dashboard, that's the easiest way to hook in. You make a script, you pass it a host name, and you get data back. Your, your ENC is responsible for returning YAML, and we'll show you what that looks like. There's also a YAML backend built into Puppet. So if you don't want to use site.pp or knows.pp pattern you see most people use, you can just use the YAML backend and specify your relationships there. And there's an LDAP backend that's built in, and that's really complicated for a lot of people to set up. And knows.pp is probably the popular one or site.pp. So that's basically saying I'm going to classify my nodes in Puppet code. So the simplest classifier you can write in the world is one that just looks up a YAML file for the host name that was passed. So if I had a really simple bash base ENC, the contract Puppet has for the exec ENC is it just passes one argument to your script, which is the host name at runtime. That's all it does. There's nothing more to it. And you can pass back whatever you want as long as it's in this format. You can specify the environment or you leave it blank. So by default, every node is in production. If you want it to be in QA, you can set that in your ENC. This could be a GUI-based ENC like the foreman. It could be the dashboard. It really doesn't matter. The contract is always the same. Whatever ENC you're using, it will only pass the host name to it. We have different terminals. So if your ENC is based over a REST call, it'd be the same thing. We're just going to pass the host name over REST, and that's all you get. We're looking at parameterized classes from this ENC. I'm kind of thrilled that the foreman now supports parameterized classes. Um, I want to check it out to see if it's real. I've never seen a GUI do it, and I want to see if it's done right. Um, but that's probably something to look for. Right now, the Puppet dashboard does not support parameterized classes. So that's a showstopper for people. We're saying use parameterized classes, but then there's no ENC that lets you configure them out of the box. But if you write your own ENC, you do have the option of declaring your classes this way, and this is exactly the same thing we were doing in site.pp earlier. And if you want, and then to configure Puppet to use your ENC, you basically say, now, I want you to switch from what you're using by default, I want you to use the exec terminus, and then you tell it what script you would like it to use to call, to pass the host name to, to expect the YAML back. So we're gonna look at an ENC. And I have this world-class ENC I'm going to show you. It's pretty awesome. Uh, user, local, bin. That's it. Woo! ENC in four lines. So I get the host name, I look in a data directory, and I spit it back out. So to use the ENC, um, the first thing we need to do is get rid of any declarations inside of site.pp. But this will conflict. You can't use them both. This will be two files trying to specify the same thing. And as you guys know, Puppet doesn't like that. So we'll get rid of that. And now, in order to use it, we need to make sure that we've configured Puppet to now use our ENC. And we'll just comment out these two lines. So we're saying use the exec base node terminus. This could have been LDAP. It could have been, you can actually write your own if you wanted to go that deep. But we'll just stick to exec for now. We have that script. And a lot of times during troubleshooting, you want to see what you're going to get before you actually run Puppet. A lot of the GUI-based ENCs offer some of this functionality. So what you can usually do is just run your script. You can just run your script, giving it the host name. This is the exact thing that Puppet will do. See what you get out of it. You can massage your data until that's right. So all the ENCs that you find out there, you can just run their ENC included script, see what the data looks like. If you're happy with it, you can move on from this point. A lot of people do it backwards. They try to just keep <laughs> editing values in the GUI until it just works. Um, this is a much easier thing just to see what the YAML that you return. Because some ENCs are complicated. Some have group logic where you're grouping your nodes and groups and then groups of groups, and you have to wait till it all gets merged down to get the final output. So this also talks a little bit about how ENCs are different than Hira. If you notice, Hira is at runtime. So it parses each value one at a time and it's all done dynamically. ENCs are responsible for giving all the data at once. You have no other opportunity once Puppet runs with the ENC to change any of the values. So now we should be able to rerun our agent. It's the same thing because we haven't changed anything in our ENC output. It's classified the same that we had in site.pp. So we'll change some of this data. You could imagine this being a GUI where you're actually 
you're actually clicking around in your GUI and you're changing values. We're gonna change our port to, I don't know, something really secure that no one will guess. We'll verify that the right thing's gonna come out and we'll rerun our agent. Fail. Anybody know why it's not working? What was that? Restart the Puppet Master. Who spent a lot of time failing on that? Only three, four, five people? The rest of you guys are lying. Or maybe that's why you don't have your ENC working. <laughs> Gonna go back to the office like, I figured it out. Public comp was so worth it. So now, there you go. Port 22, nice and secure. No one's gonna guess that people will run on port 22 by default, so they won't even try. And that's it, now we're using our ENC. That's all the ENC is. You're responsible for providing the classification, optionally the environment, um, for a particular node. I consider that everything being fully external. You're not using site.pp anymore. You're not hard coding values inside your manifest. Everything is external. And that puts you in a good position to switch external tools, right? If all your data is in a nice uh, database where you can just hook other ENCs to it, or maybe write your own, you don't ever have to go and mess with your puppet manifest. So I've been at places where we haven't touched the puppet code in years because after a while, you get it to the point where you can drive the whole puppet stack with data. That's probably a good place to be in. So what are the differences, really quick? So Hira, it can do classification. Don't ever use it. Hira includes, please avoid that. It works, but don't do it. Um, externalizes data, dynamic lookups using factor, and you can do custom backends. The ENC does classification. That's its initial design. It also does external data. The way we would like you to use external data there are parameterized classes. You can have custom workflows, so you can use groups or something like hire, you can do anything you want in your ENC. Um, there are a lot of custom ENCs out there. Foreman, the dashboard, Cobbler is another popular one. Um, you can also control the environment from your ENC. So these are the most popular ENCs that I hear most people use. Um, Puppet dashboard, the enterprise console is also an ENC. A lot of the new cloud management tools also act as an ENC, so they do stuff like spin up things on Amazon and also work as a way to classify your nodes with roles, and that's usually their Puppet integration. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about really quickly is data bindings. Data bindings is brand new in Puppet 3.0, and what it does is it allows you to do automatic lookups. So you still wanna use Hira, you may be using the ENC, but the problem is with the ENC, if you use a class that brings in other classes, and you haven't specified values in your ENC, you get no values, right? Because with the ENC, you have to provide everything up front. If another class needs values, you're done. You're just gonna get Puppet errors. So the conflict there is how do you mix the two, Hira and the ENC? And we wanted something to fix the namespace problem, right? If you have port in Hira and you have three different services that all use port, that's not gonna work out well, especially with modules coming out the forge. There's also a resolution order. We wanted to make sure this was backward compatible. So if you're using site.pp with this new data bindings, we will respect whatever things users supply. So if you're defining a class with site.pp and you specify or you're using the ENC and you should specify some values for your uh, parameterized class, we'll use those first. If you don't specify anything, instead of falling immediately back to the defaults specified in the module, we'll do this transparent lookup in Hira, right? It's actually pluggable, but out of the box data binding resorts to Hira, which is there by default. And then if Hira doesn't have a value, we just use the class defaults as normal. All right, so we're gonna show this really quick. This is gonna be fast. And what we're gonna do really, really quick, I'm gonna do my magic. I need to use another puppet module. I mean, another puppet master. Anyone know this trick? How many people had to do this before? <laughs> it's not that bad. All right, so we're gonna run our master. Like no pressure when you do that. So now we're going to connect to master 3.0. See if this works for us. 
All right, so it ran. So what happened really quick here is we're using the same ENC base code where there's no higher lookup function, it's just a parameterized class. But now Puppet 3.0 does something different. It looks at all the values and does a namespace key lookup in all of your backends until it finds a value. And if it doesn't, it just falls back. So we'll look really quick at the data. And we'll look at the data for the note really quick. And you see that now we have to specify namespace keys. So company name alone won't work. You have to namespace it. And the namespace is a combination of the class name plus the actual key that you're looking up. So that prevents namespace conflicts. And this works with the ENC. So if your ENC says, hey, use these classes, data bindings can take over and do the lookup inside of Hira. And this works with multiple backends as well. So that's data bindings. So in summary, we're at the end of the talk, Mike. So in summary, you start with parameterized classes. Take your code now, and the first step is to refactor. Figure out what stuff you want people to actually change and what stuff is private to the particular module you have. That makes it easier to share. And at that point, once you have parameterized class, you can actually put that on the forge, and it will work with people's ENCs, and it'll work with people using site.pp. If you put higher functions in there, Ryan will probably find you. Um, so try to avoid those. But if you have to, higher is a good natural progression if you want, like the idea of having text files that you can actually check in your code or check in your data and see changes over time using something simple like Git, higher is a good next step there. And then to me, if you've got parameterized classes, take advantage of an ENC. Get rid of nodes.pp, site.pp, put everything in an external node classifier, and it makes it easier to manage both node classification and external data. And then you saw data bindings. They also work with the ENC, but it's in Puppet 3.0 only. And if you want to learn more about this, I'm converting my hands-on tutorials to open sessions, so people will have a chance to like install it, maybe write a custom back in, and there'll be people there to help you. I found Ohad, he'll be there to show off Foreman, and I want him to prove to me that parameterized classes actually works from a GUI. Um, so he'll be there in the ENC session. Um, thank you for attending. So if you guys have questions, uh, you're just going to have to come find him in the hallway. Because you got about five minutes to get to your next talk. Sorry, this one ran long. I apologize. Yeah, the, <laughs> the next talk is all about PuppetDB, Puppet so awesome. you can just sit right here and chill.